for the first time in a while. Um, it's good to see you all here this morning. And if uh, you'd like to connect with us, we would love to connect with you. And the best way that we can do that is through our little green connection card in the pew rack in front of you. Um, so if you have any updates on what's going on, if you have a prayer need or anything like that, fill that out and you can uh, put that in the offering boxes in the back. And if you are new here today um, and you fill out that green card, we have a gift for you. And so if you fill that out and bring it back to the kiosk in the lobby after service, um, we will take that card and we'll give you a gift and we'll get to know you and you can get to know us. So uh, there's that. Yeah, awesome, right, Mike? Yeah, it's so good. So a few things going on this week. Tomorrow, tomorrow is August 1st. It is the first of the month. And so that means a couple things. First off, we have our new scripture memory for the month in the bulletin for you. That's going to be uh, Lamentations 3, verses 22 through 24. I'll read that real quick. It says, Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. So that's our, our little passage you guys can work on for the month. Um, you can break it up into doing a verse each week, and then by the end of the month, you'll have the whole thing memorized. Um, and we've just been memorizing some awesome scriptures this year, so I encourage you to do that. Also, tomorrow, with it being the first of the month, we have our worship and prayer night tomorrow night. Um, and we also encourage you guys to fast tomorrow, as it's the uh, first Monday of the month. So um, come join us here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock for a time of prayer and worship. Um, and it's, it's an awesome time to be together as the body of Christ, singing songs and, and praying both for our church, for our community, for the world, uh, for believers around the world. Um, we, we, we cover everything, so it's a great time. A couple schedule changes uh, just for now. Um, we're not having midweek Bible study. Um, Hoyt is taking a break from that, and so that will kick back up in September when Team Kids starts back up. And then uh, Susan also is taking a break from her Thursday women's Bible study. That's going to be on pause for August, so no, no Bible study there, and that will start up in September as well. And then next Sunday, August 7th, um, we are doing lake baptisms out at the lake. So at 3 o'clock out there, we're going to have, it's not, a, it's not our worship service for Sunday. It's, a, it's another thing along with normal gathering here on Sunday at 1030. So at 3 p.m., we'll be out at the lake, um, and hopefully we'll have some people getting baptized. And uh, we'll, we'll worship together. We'll praise God that people are expressing their faith through baptism. Um, and so if you are interested in that, if you want to be baptized, please come talk to one of the elders. Come talk to me or Brandon or one of the other guys here um, and let us know that you're interested so that we can get everything ready and squared away for that. And that will be next Sunday. And then we have our prayer force alert in the bulletin there for you guys for the month. So you can tuck that into your Bible. Just remember to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, especially those who are being persecuted for their faith. And then... Last but not least, uh, you guys have been kept up to date as to what we're doing with our backpacks and Bibles for the Afghan church down in the Bay Area. And so it's really cool. This past Thursday, um, we had 15 people come together to pray and to pack up backpacks. And we're going to be bringing 75 backpacks down uh, to the Bay Area to pass out to families down there. And so, yeah, awesome. And... So we, we as a church gave a chunk of money towards it, and then you guys also helped raise extra funds on top of that. So we had $1,250 for backpacks and $500 for Bibles. So that is all going towards that. Um, that's helped cover all the supplies for the backpacks, and there's some extra change on top of that that we can just use for helping out the Afghan church down there. So um, what's really cool is that we actually have a team going down with the backpacks. So I'm going to invite Lori Holst, uh, Pam Baum, and Trilly Carter to come on up. This is our small team of awesome women who are going to go down with the backpacks and uh, help pass them out. Yeah, I'll come down. So they're going to be leaving Tuesday and coming back Friday, and their main distribution time is going to be on Wednesday, passing out the backpacks. Um, but it's just awesome to see uh, people stepping up and living out their faith, um, especially in these unique ways that um, we can reach out to people um, who have never heard about Jesus and that they can come to faith in him. So I'm going to pray for them, and I encourage you guys to put out a hand. You know, um, we're going to support them in prayer right now. Father, I thank you so much for how 
you have made yourself known, that you are a God who wants to be known and wants to love us, and that we have received that love from you, God, because you first loved us. And God, I pray for these women and for these backpacks that have been packed, and just for the hands and the hearts that have prepared them and prayed over them, Lord. I pray as they go down um, to be distributed to these, these families um, who have come to the states, who have um, fled persecution and different things, Lord, I pray that these backpacks can be a means to come to know you, God, just another way that you have revealed yourself and revealed your love. God, I pray for Lori and Pam and Shirley that you are their foundation, their solid rock as they, as they pursue you in faith. Lord, I pray it's just a blessed time, a time for them to share and to serve and to love others as you first loved them, God. So I pray you, you equip them with what they need. You give them the strength with what they need. You give them boldness to share of the hope that you have given them and that there are soft hearts prepared, Lord, that you are working um, amazing things through this church down in the Bay Area, Lord, um, that is just making impacts in this unique community and that we can be faithful to serve and to, to act in the ways that you desire, God. So I just thank you for these women, Lord. I pray that you... Um, just encourage them and equip them with what they need. And I pray that we as a church can be continuing to pray for them and supporting them uh, in the ways that you're working in them. God. Father, I just thank you for this morning and this time for us to worship and to praise you, Lord. And Father, we pray for the fire in Wairika too and just the first responders out there that are fighting and the families that have had to evacuate, Lord. I pray that you are working in the midst of all that, that you are helping um, keep that fire where it needs to be and not go any further. God, it's, it's scary, and it's life-threatening, and so I pray that you are working in mighty ways, that we as a church can be the hands and feet of you and serving the community in that way, too. God, we love you, and we just thank you for so much for how you have first loved us, and we pray this all in your name. Amen. Thanks, man. Well, good morning. Good to see you all. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 34, if you turn there in your Bibles with me, Psalm chapter 34. Cruising right along in our series, um, that is an ongoing series, right? We joke about that. It's the summer in the Psalms, and we'll probably be done in about 12 years or so, right? So we're in Psalm 34 today, and uh, looking forward to it. We're also going to be partaking in the Lord's Supper today, and uh, just remembering uh, what what Christ has done for us, and, and when we partaking the Lord's Supper, it's not partaking because we have done something special or that we're good enough or we're trying to earn our way. It is going to Him because we have experienced His goodness, His grace, His love, and His forgiveness. And we, we partake freely because He gave His life to us freely. So today we are in Psalm 34. Uh, today's title is Taste and See, and uh, it kind of went really well today, I guess, with Lord's Supper as we taste and see. Um, and Psalm 34 uh, is an interesting psalm. It's, uh, it's a psalm of David. And um, the context, I want to give a little bit of the context of this psalm. Um, now, in, in 1 Samuel, you'll see this experience because he subscripts this psalm. Uh, it says, uh, concerning David, when he pretended to be insane in the pres presence of Abimelech, who drove him out and he departed. Now, the context of that is in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And you can go there and read that on your own later on. But I'll give you a little bit of that story. Remember, now David had grown, uh, grown up. He'd been anointed by, uh, by Samuel to, uh, to be king of Israel. And eventually he went out to the field with some lunches for his brothers and to check on the battle. And they were facing the Philistines and Goliath, right? And what does he do? He puts the lunch down. He picks up the slingshot and he goes out and slays Goliath because Goliath is defying the armies of the living God, right? So he, he defeats Goliath. And, and there's some fame now coming David's way, and he moves up in prominence among Israel. And, and this made Saul, King Saul, at the time, jealous, and it made, it, it made him intimidated as well. Uh, and, and Saul was eventually so consumed with anger and, and jealousy, he tried to pursue David and to kill David, right? David went on the run away from Saul. And as David was running, part of the story was that he fled to Gath, which is interesting because this is where, where Goliath was from. So he ran to the city of the person he slayed in battle. And he was well known, right? So it kind of a, a, a maybe a brain fart here. Uh, but he, was, he, it was, he went there and they recognized him. Uh, and he, he wanted to, to save his life from Saul. And he ended up going to a place where everyone knew 
who he was and where he, they wanted to take his life, right? So he's kind of in this trap, in this predicament. And the king found out and, and confronted him. And uh, what he did, he decided, I'm just going to pretend to lose my mind. I'm going to be a crazy man. So he starts drooling on himself and drools going through his beard. And he's kind of scratching the doorposts of the gate. And, and, and this king comes out like, what have you brought me? Who, just, let's get this guy. I don't want any more crazy people. Push him away. Get him out. Let him go. And so the king pushes him away and pushes him out. And, and his life is spared. Right? King David, eventually King David, this is David before he's king, but he's, he's been anointed, right? This is David who, who was in the midst of great enemies, and he was the one who killed their greatest warrior who was from Gath. And at that moment in time, he, I mean, what do, what do you think is going to happen? You're dead meat. You're toast, right? But what happened? God provided for him. And, and Psalm 34 is, is his overflow, his outflow of that experience. And and what he wants you and I to do, he's, he's inviting you and I in to experience God in the way he experienced God at Gath. In a way that, that we can taste and see the goodness of God. Yes, David pretended he was insane. And I, I don't know, maybe that was to protect him from what, the blow that was about to come to him. But in some way, God showed up and protected David. It wasn't David at all that rescued himself. God rescued him. And, and if we look at our own lives, we can see uh, glimmers and instances in our own lives where God God stepped in. God showed up. We experienced God's power in his hand in some mighty way, and we should offer, offer praise to him as well. So this is the, the context. What an experience for him, right? What an experience for David at, at Gath, and then what an experience for him to share and invite us in. So that's the, the context of this passage. So I'm going to pray for us, and we'll read the entire psalm together, and then we'll break it apart, okay? Let's pray. Father, I'm, I'm so grateful, God, to be here. Uh, God, as we gather, we gather to worship you to think about you, to remember you. God, we come because we have in some way or another, uh, God, at least most of us have tasted and seen that you are good. And God, we know your goodness. And we want more of your goodness. So God, we, we ask that you would convict our hearts. God, challenge our hearts, that our hearts would be open and receptive to your word. That God, our desire would be for you and to obey you. And God, that, that we would leave here, God, honoring you. We would be here, uh, leave here obeying you, God, as we, as we go out into the communities that we love and serve and work in, Lord, that you would you would help us to, to stand for you there. And God, invite people in to taste and see that the Lord is good. So be with today, us today, God, as we look to your scripture. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 34, we're reading the entire thing. You ready to go? So, concerning David, when he pretended to be insane in the presence of Abimelech, who drove him out and he departed. Verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He rescued me from all my fears. Those who look on him or to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord. For those who fear him lack nothing. Young lions lack food and go hungry. But those who seek the Lord will not lack anything good. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? And keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil, to remove all memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. The one who is righteous has many ad uh, adversaries or adversities, but the Lord rescues him from them all. He protects all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil brings death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. This is the word of God. 
All right, so we're going to look at uh, this title today, Taste and See, and we're going to look at what David is inviting us into, all right? So number one, we look at Taste and See, is this, Taste and See when you are hungry and thirsty. You can taste and see when you are hungry and thirsty. Let's look at this, this first part, verses 1 through 7. Sorry, 1 through 8, actually. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. So David comes out with this, hey, I'm going to bless the Lord, I'm going to praise Him, He is amazing. Uh, he, his praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Now stop there for a minute. David is, is inviting us to, to see that he has had this crazy experience, this amazing interaction with God, how God has rescued him, and he can't keep from singing. And he says, those who are humble around me, who are hearing my praise, the humble that hear my praise, they will what? They will hear and be glad. It's a challenge for us, too, because I think sometimes we, we just don't want to hear people blabber on about how good God is in their life. Like, okay, okay, that's for you. David's saying the humble will hear what God is doing even in other people, and they will be glad. And then he has this invitation. Look at verse 3. He says, proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. You know, we talk about those songs, you know, like, how great is our God, sing with me, how great. That's, that's David saying, how great is our God, and he wants you and I to sing with him. He's saying, proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. I, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and, and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. Let's, let's stop there for a minute. You see in this idea of being hungry and thirsty, like we will really taste and see when we're hungry and thirsty. Part of that's in humility, and we'll see that in a minute. And David says, the humble will hear and be glad. But look at what he's saying. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. Right, And he rescued me from all my fears. This word fears here, it could be the, the troubles that are around, like the, the dreaded circumstances that he's about to face. But it also could, be me, could actually mean that they're my dreads, the things that my, I fear, the fears I have. Like I'm afraid, and I'm afraid often, and he's rescuing me from that fear. And see, when you and I really are realistic and really are transparent, I think that we would say, God, I, need, I want rescue. I don't want to be so anxious. I don't want to be so afraid. I don't want to always be concerned or in trouble or like I'm walking on eggshells wherever I go. I don't want that. I want your peace. And see, that's a desire from a heart. That's a, that's a hunger from our heart. Now, if, you, if you're like, well, I know it's there and I'm afraid, but I'm just going to stuff it down and I'm not going to deal with it, no big deal. If that's you, you're not getting in that humble position where you're hungry for something else. You're just saying, I'm going to just keep eating what I'm fed, and I'm just going to go with it, and I'm going to tough it out. David said, no, I'm, I'm not going to stop it. I'm going to seek the Lord. And he answered me. He rescued me from all my fears. And it says, those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. We want to understand. We want to be known and sometimes that's painful, right? Because if we're deeply known, that means we're exposed. But that's, that's necessary for us to truly have the right experience with God, to be able to really, truly taste and see. We have to be transparent and be known by Him. And, but what the promise is here that when we are, when we're transparent in that way, that we'll look to Him and we, our faces, will be radiant with joy. And why? Because we're going to see clearly. The, um, our faces will never be ashamed. We'll see clearly and we'll be being transformed in the image of God over and over by faith. That we're becoming more and more like Him. And, and that means we like what we see in the mirror better and better every day. This is a longing. This is the hunger we're talking about. We, this is what He's saying. I hungered. I thirsted. I, was, I needed these, these, dr these dreadful fears to be gone. I needed these circumstances to be, uh, be rescued from. And I needed to be full of joy in my, in my countenance. And He said, God gave me that as I, as I sought Him. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him. Crying out does not, listen, when you're full, I'm, you're not crying out for anything. You're like, you're maybe like mercy, like please, you know, but no, you're not crying out for more food. You don't want to be have anything else. But when you're hungry, what do you say? I'm hungry. I, I bring too many stories in with my kids all the time, but that's, that's I mean, they're kids. They're nine and seven. It's, it's like 3 in the afternoon, 4 in the afternoon, or even later day. It's 5 o'clock. And dinner, dinner is like literally on the stove and on the barbecue. I'm hungry. Can I have a snack? Like it's just that, that plea, right? I'm hungry. We need to be hungry for the Lord. And then he goes in, the, last, uh, the angel of the Lord encamps him, uh, around those who fear him and rescues them. There's power from God to rescue. There's, there's way more into this that you could look into your own, on yourself, on your own. 
Verse 8, though. Again, the invitation here. Taste and see that the Lord is good. If you're hungry, now you can taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in Him, in God. See, David implores us and exhorts us and he invites us. He says, listen, He rescued me and, and, and you can be safe too. He will rescue you as well. If Psalm 34 is anything, it's an invitation for us. It's for you and I. David is inviting us to proclaim the goodness of God and then he invites us to exalt God's name together. But more than that, David is inviting us to experience God's goodness in our lives. Taste and see that the Lord is good, he says. He wants us to taste and see that the Lord is good. And only when we really taste and see that the Lord is good, and it has to come from that hunger, then then we can adequately or accurately exalt Him, right? If, If we haven't hungered and we haven't tasted and seen, there's no way we can accurately praise God for who He is. Because the truth is, you really don't know, you really haven't experienced that. Now what if I said this to you? God is good. All the time. Right, we say that back and forth to each other right? at camp, it's all the time. It was being back and forth, and that's a way to get attention for the kids. Like, hey, snap in here, look, and pay attention. But it's true that God is good, amen? But how? How is God good? We say that, but how is God good? Do you know? I, I want you to shout something out. How is God good and praiseworthy? One word thing. What, how have you experienced his goodness? Go. Mercy. Mercy. Keep going. Always. Salvation. Faithful. Over here what? Faithful. He's faithful. Provision. Provision. Yes. What's that? He watches over us. He's given us Jesus. Grace, right? Every day I need it. It right? sounds like you kind of taste it a little bit, right? Is the Lord good? That's why we can say God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. But I want to illustrate this a little more clearly. <clears throat> I'm going to need two volunteers. And I, I want you to know you shouldn't be gluten-free or keto-friendly or whatever. Like, like no, no weird stuff going on here. Okay. No one volunteering. I need two volunteers. I need two volunteers. Uh, people who, Chase, Suze. Oh, there comes Ko. Ko can come up. Suze, you stay there. That's good. Come on, up, you guys. You, sh- you, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna get a microphone here so you guys can talk into the video too. <coughs> yeah, it should be a gross food challenge for you though, yeah. right? Okay, so I'm I'm gonna explain. You go stand on that side and over there. I'm going to explain, I'm going to show them something, I'm going to show you something. And, and hold that for a second. And I'll, I'm going to like just describe it as best I can, and you're, you and I are going to be probably like David, drool in our beard, okay? So just, okay, first, first up here, we have Chase, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you do this one here. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> now this is from the pastry shop in Mount Shasta from today, this morning. This is one of their specialties that they make every week. This is a, uh, a coffee cake, and it is super moist, and it's, it's got some good texture on the outside, like, like the edges of the cake that get like that little fry going on in the pan as it's baking, right? And they put blueberries in here as well, and they've got layers of cinnamon and sugar and just that amazing crumble on top that just enhances the coffee cake in an amazing, amazing way. Um, there's su- like sugar sprinkled on top. It's like the bigger grains of sugar, so it just gives you that. That crunch, right? Right? <laughs> right? Anyone licking their lips yet? Oh, yeah. I'm, like, I'm drooling. Some of that. It's pretty big. He might share, but maybe not, right? So, I, Chase, I want you to go ahead and, and take a bu- just take a piece and, and take a bite of that, okay? And, and then you're hold the plate. Okay? So enjoy that for a second. KO, I've got one for you here. This, from the same place. This is a lemon blueberry scone, right? And, and it's not one of those scones you buy in the, the cheap plastic packages at Ray's that are a little bit dry. All you guys think it's good. Uh-uh, it's not good. This is good. This is that light but still, but still firm, right, texture. It's like that biscuity but also cakey, right, with the lemon flavoring in there. It also has the nice crumble on top, 
uh, with all that sugar on top that just makes it just go down your system and get you wired. I mean, it's amazing. So this is an amazing scone. Okay, I want you to go ahead and take a, take a piece of that and, and take a bite of that. Enjoy that. <laughs> What's behind curtain number three? Yeah, isn't it a great day? Go ahead. You take, yeah. How is that? That's good. I'll let, you, I'll let you eat that. Maybe you take a couple bites to really experience it, right? Really get it. Okay, so I, I want you to, to answer a question here, okay? A couple questions. First, Chase, did I, did I do an adequate job of ex explaining that food? Yes. I did. Was, was the ex explanation as good or better than or not quite as good as the real thing? I think it was on par. It was on par. So let me ask you, here's the follow-up question to that. Would you rather me take that and just explain it again to you and, and enjoy the ex explanation? No way. Or would you rather take that and actually experience it for the rest of the service? I'd rather experience the rest of the service. Okay, thanks. <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Give him a hand. <laughs> All right, KO. Same thing first. Did I, did I adequately explain that? It's good. It, it's good. <laughs> okay, so do you, would you like me to explain it and then take it back and you can just enjoy the explanation or would you like to take that back and just enjoy it and share it with your bride well, i think i love myself <laughs> no. okay, yeah, there it is very good yeah that's a good answer okay, go ahead and have a seat ko thank you give him a hand right. so uh, i mean you heard how great the experience was he's not even going to share it with sally here so uh, that's up to them on what they're going to do but anyway so i, I want to understand like we, when we talk about tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, it's an experience to taste and see. Amen? It's not, it, listen, you, you shouldn't just settle for the ingredient list. Like if I, I mean, maybe you want a Snickers bar that aren't even close to as good as what is out there right now, right here. But you, if you just go in the store and read the ingredients, is that enough for you? Right? It's not, think about the cooking shows you see that are being judged, they're judged, they're competitions. Right, and what, what do the chefs do? They bring a plate of awesome food, and they set it before the judges, and, and they say, I prepared for you today a whatever it is. And then do the judges just sit there and not taste it and judge it? Not at all. They want, they want to experience every bite, every flavor, every layer of flavor within that dish that's being presented. It's so, so important for us to actually taste and see and to experience that. I want to read a, a quote from one of my commentaries that I was reading this week. It says this, and this is from Exalting Christ in the Psalms. It says, every week when a pastor gets up to preach, he is essentially listing off ingredients. Hopefully he does it so well that those who hear him long to taste for themselves. But the truth is, hearing the ingredients every week can never take the place of personally tasting. A person must taste for themselves and see that the Lord is good. Jesus is meaningless to so many churchgoers because they've never personally experienced him. To many, Jesus is distant and impersonal. They know about God, but they don't know God. They've heard about him, but never experienced him. But in Psalm 34, David is speaking from his own experience and pleading with us to have our own experiences as well. But what we are taught every week is not just the list of ingredients. It is, it's the recipe. It's the instructions of to go and taste and see as well. And we have to. We, we ought to desire it, long for it, hunger and thirst for it. First Peter chapter 2, it says this, like newborn infants desire, right, crave, hunger, the pure milk of the word, so that by it you might grow up in your salvation. If... You have tasted that the Lord is good. For you and I, we go to the Word of God. We desire it. We hunger for it. We, we want to see Him in His fullness, and, and we want to experience Him day by day as we trust in Him in faith. Listen, we all want good things in our lives, right? Taste that the Lord is good. We want good things in our lives. But David wants us to know that our desires for goodness actually come from God, and our, our ultimate cravings, our hungers for goodness can only be realized through our relationship, a day-by-day -day vibrant relationship with the Lord who fills us with His righteousness when we will come to Him humbly in faith. And that leads us to number two. If we're going to be hungry and thirsty, what's next? What, and that's the, I've kind of given you some ingredients there and listed them off, what's prepared for you. 
But how do you make it? How do you get it? Number two is taste and see by turning to the Lord in humility and repentance. The short answer is you've got to get over yourself. And you've got to get over whatever is satisfying you because it's not satisfying you the way that Jesus can. Let's go back to our psalm, looking at verses 8, or I'm sorry, 9 through 16. You who are his holy ones, now catch these words. These are instructions, imperatives for you and I. You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord. Circle that or underline that in the Bible. Fear the Lord, right? Those who fear him will lack nothing. Isn't that great when you're hungry that if you fear the Lord, you can lack nothing? So that's part of this recipe, to fear the Lord, live in obedient devotion and awe of him. Uh, Verse 10, young lions, they lack food and and they go hungry. But those who seek, they're to seek the Lord, will lack nothing, not one good thing. You you and I are to fear the Lord and you and I are to to seek the Lord, to pursue him. Then verse 11, look at what it says. He's inviting, come, come listen. That you and I need to be attentive and, and, and ready and, and, and willing and, and present. Come and listen to me, he says. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? Then keep, here it is, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. So again, there's fearing the Lord, seeking the Lord, coming and listening, being attentive to the Lord, keeping ourselves from evil. Right, then then verse four, four, uh, 14, Turn away from evil and do what is good. This is repentance. We turn away from evil and we run to the Lord and we do what is good. We, we, we live holy and righteous. Seek, verse 14, the B, seek peace and pursue it. So we turn from evil, we turn to what is good, then we seek peace and we pursue it. We, we seek peace like like the, like the righteousness that he gives. We seek it because that, that's the righteousness that he gives is what gives us peace and brings us peace. Let's look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord. This is now favor. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. So he's given us this recipe of seeking and fearing and coming and listening and keeping your tongue and turning away and again seeking peace. And as we do that, then this righteousness is given to us. And the, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. God's favor is there. God's turned to us in, in, with his face of grace towards us. The eyes of the righteous are on, or the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open for their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil, to remove all memory of them from the earth. Listen, you and I may not think evil is, is what God thinks evil is. We think evil is the Taliban, right? We think evil is murder and, and, and rape and, and molestation, child abuse. It is. It's evil. But what God is also saying is evil is us not fearing him, not seeking him, not turning to him, not keeping our tongue from evil, not turning to him. But when we do, his face is towards us. This grace is towards us. Turning toward him and his face of grace will allow us to really taste and see. But pride is what will get in the way. And his face is against those and opposed to those who do what is evil, who are full of pride. Pride says, listen, I'm, I'm looking for satisfaction. I'm looking for fulfillment in something, but it's something somewhere other than God. And the Lord's face is set against those who do that. I hope that's not you. But again, David is pleading with us to accept this invitation Because he knows that those who trust in God, who who fear and keep and seek and come and listen and turn away from sin and turn toward good and seek peace, he knows that those who do that, that that God will then satisfy the longings of their heart. They will be fully satisfied through a relationship with him. That's the point of Psalm 34, is for us to be satisfied and know that we can be satisfied in him, a, a passage out of Ecclesiastes. When all has been heard, I, I think it's when all has been said and done, right? The conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commands. This is for all humanity. Fear God and keep his commands. It's for all humanity. When all is said and done across the whole board, across the whole world, fear God and keep his commands. This is what David is saying. Like, come to him in reverent awe and fear and wonder, knowing that he's God and you're not. But he is a God who is is full of goodness, and he's mighty to save, and has a face of grace that wants to turn towards you and, and give you a righteousness that you never, ever deserve. But what does it take? Humility. 
it takes humility, and it's so difficult for us to do. So let's talk a little more about this turning to the Lord in humility and repentance. I do want to share a story about my son, and it happened yesterday. Uh, my Sunday school class that I'm in with Jeff and the rest of the crew, we, we get to share tales there too, but, but I, I, and struggles, and how do we get out of these struggles? But yesterday morning, we get up, and, and uh, the kids wrestling, fighting, bickering, and, and doing things that normal kids do. My kids aren't bad. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not shaming my kids. They do normal kid stuff. And, and we're in that mode of teaching them how to, how to be kind, right, and compassionate, and how to, how to repent of sin, and how to seek forgiveness and be restored. So this happened yesterday morning, and we're in our living room, and, and you know, trying just, hey, this is a Saturday morning, I've got all day to do this, let's just be calm and cool and collected. So I'm sitting on the chair, and, and, and Wesley, my son, sitting on my lap. And he's in a little bit of trouble, but the trouble is that we're going to talk through this, which is almost worse than just getting in trouble and being done with it, right? And, and, and we heard it oftentimes, how long is this going to take? How, can we just stop talking about this? That's the words that come up, right? Can we just stop? I, and I, I wish we could. Isn't it, wouldn't it be nice if we could do something bad and just forget about it and stop talking about it? Wouldn't that be wonderful? It doesn't happen that way. See, that's what re- humble repentance is. So, so we had this time where, where we were talking about what he had done. And I, I explained this is what you had done wrong. And, and he, he wanted to make excuses, he wanted to make defenses, he wanted to ultimately just not talk about it, stop talking about this, right? And as we, as we were sharing and talking, I, I, I said, this, is can be in, this can end really quick. He's like, why does it have to go on forever? I said, because your heart is making it go on forever. Your heart. What, and you want to know, what do you mean by that? Well, you're, you're trying to defend yourself. You're trying to, to reason out. You're trying to just skirt this underneath the rug and not, not say sorry and not be repentant what it takes is acknowledging hey I, i've messed up i've made a mistake I, i'm sorry for that forgive me that that's what and that's so simple as in words right but so extremely hard for us to do this whole time he's on one knee like just super tense and i mean every muscle in his body is just i mean and and, and goes god it's been 23 minutes he's literally counting the time Dad, it's been 32 minutes. Dad, it's been 37. I, I know, son. You know what you need to do. Dad, it's been 49 minutes. I'm not kidding, right? Some, some of you, some of us, we spent years there. Years. Turn, not Saying we taste and see, but really, you just can describe God. You've never, fl- you ever, never savored that. You spent years in rebellion. So what does it look like to come around? And this was the most special thing to me. And above everything else about my son, this is what I want you to understand. Probably about the 49 and a half minute mark. He finally understood. His body l- loosened up. And he's, he said, and he's still on one knee, kind of not, not wanting to face me. He's facing away. He says, I, I was wrong. I'm sorry that I did that. Can you forgive me? And, and you know what he immediately did? Before I could offer, like, forgiveness or, or anything else could go on, he turned his whole person towards me, leaned in and just hugged me. He just hugged me. Why? Why did he do that? He spent 49 minutes resisting everything I had to say in, in, in quiet compassion and grace he resisted every moment of it. And finally, when he turned away from sin, when he repented of sin, he could fully embrace his father. And there was safety there, and there was forgiveness there, and there was love there, and there was grace there. And guess what he got to do? He got to taste and see that, you know, I'm good. And, and I love you, and I care for you, and I want, I want what's best for you. And, and you know what else happened? That weight, that burden that he was carrying was gone. He was happy and chipper and plain and interacting well. And all of that anger and all of that stuff that James says don't do that was there was gone. It just melted away. You and I need to stop resisting God. Stop coming to him with our pride and our ego and our sin and saying, I'm, I'm bringing this with. This is, I'm going to stand here all day and stop talking about it. And God's like, No. You're not going to find grace there. You're not going to find favor there. Grace is only needed and bestowed on people who need it and and come to it for forgiveness. Come to me for forgiveness. 
I wish that you and I would do that more often. But that's what tasting and seeing is. It's humbling ourselves. You know, too many of us treat Jesus like we treat our health, though. Right? Here, here's what we do. All week long, we feast on junk food, spiritual junk food. Until Sunday, when we finally come to get our healthy meal, right? It's like, hey, it's our weekly salad at church. It's going to be healthy and good for us. And like it's going to negate all the unhealthy meals we've had all week long. But it won't. In order to really know God and experience God's goodness, we must humbly choose to satisfy the cravings of our heart with God all the time and not junk. So you have to humble yourself, which means you have to let yourself be exposed, which is the hardest part. Saying sorry means you're sorry for something you've done wrong, that you have done wrong or that I have done wrong, right? It's personal. But Jesus says this in Matthew, my favorite passage about this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You and I need to become poor in spirit, grieving, mourning over our sin, right? There's the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. We should be weeping over our sin, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble or meek or empty. Those who come to God empty saying, I, I, I'm leaving aside my pride. I'm going to let you be my Savior, and, and I'm not going to be my Savior. And when you come empty, blessed are those who then hunger and thirst for righteousness because then, and only then, when you are hungry, when you are empty, when you are mourning over your sin and you understand it and you repent of it and you turn to him in faith, only then can you be filled adequately by his righteousness. And it's completely satisfying. So wh where did this righteousness come from? Romans 3, I want to read this to you. Romans 3, 22 through 26. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who will believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but they are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What is this saying? It's saying, hey, righteousness is offered to those who would believe in Christ. And it's, it's available for all because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us need it. But we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption offered in Christ. It means that Christ did the work that you think you should be doing. Christ did enough. He did all of the work when you actually and I can't do enough. And then verse 25, it says that God presented Him as Jesus. God gave Jesus as a mercy seat by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. What did God do? How did He give us this righteousness? How did He achieve for us everything that we try all our lives to achieve and can't? He did it through His Son, Jesus. Right? And I know so many of you are like, I know this. I know this story. I've trusted Him. And I, yeah, you've tasted and seen, but you need to be reminded of that. And maybe for some of you, you've just heard the words and said, oh yeah, I, I know what it's all about. I know what it's all about. But you've never taken a bite. You have no clue what it's really about. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came down and died the death that you deserve. He paid the penalty that you should have paid. He shed his blood on a cross, and it should have been you and me. And he did that freely so that you and I could come to him in faith, not with our own, our own pride and ego and, and add him to us, to us. We come to him with nothing. And we come to him with nothing. We approach the blood of the cross in faith. We exchange our nothing for everything everything. And there's then freedom for us to seek and see and savor the Savior. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. You and I come to faith and come to be justified through faith in Christ. It's not on our own. So today as we, as we think about tasting and seeing, we're gonna, we got some more to go here, but as we think about that, as we think about the Lord's table today, this is an opportunity for you and I to come and, and say, God, we see, we've seen you, we, we have sought you, we, we have tasted you, and you are good. And, and when we come forward to partake in the Lord's Supper, we just experience that again, that God, this is your goodness. Your goodness was, was you giving your body and you shedding your blood for us for the forgiveness of sin. And as we walk that aisle, there's nothing good in us. It's all about his goodness. And, and that's where David was. David was, it's all about him. He's amazing. I had to act like a crazy man in front of people who should have killed me. And I, I didn't get myself out of that. God did it all. And I want to invite you to experience God's goodness as well. We turn to the Lord in humility 
and we repent of our own sin and selfishness, our own ego, and we express our faith in him to forgive, and he is mighty to save. We need to experience and to taste and to see his goodness, and we will do that as we partake in the Lord's Supper. But we also do that as we, as we obey, as we live righteously. We, we seek to turn from evil and turn towards him. And we've been talking about baptism for the last few weeks. It, it's such an amazing opportunity for you, if you haven't done that, if, you, if you've trusted Christ, if, you've, if he's your Savior, this is that opportunity to be like David and, and proclaim him publicly and say, I, I want you all to come sing with me, come rejoice with me as, as, as you follow Christ in obedience. As you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow Christ in obedience and be baptized to show him off even more so that people can worship God. And that, that when you, you and I do that, when we partake in the Lord's Supper or when we follow Christ in obedience and be baptized, that is, a, that is an opportunity for us to taste and see and to show that we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I know and some of you, you're, it's like, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. No one's ever ready for that. It's about tasting and seeing that the Lord is good and just entrusting that He is good and following through in obedience. So I, I encourage you, to, if you're on the fence on that, to do that. Taste and see, number three. So we taste and see because we're hungry and thirsty. We taste and see by turning to the Lord in humility and repentance. And finally, number three, we taste and see in order to be rescued and satisfied in Him. To be rescued and satisfied in Him. Look at verses 17 through 22 in Psalm 34. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. What do the righteous do? They say, help! I need you. I can't do this anymore. I can't do this on my own. I'm not good enough. Help. And what does God do? He hears. He hears and he rescues them from all their trouble. The trouble you and I have is the consequences and wages of sin, which is death. And, and that, that separation from God and, and that we are enemies of God before, uh, until we come to faith in Christ and we can become friends of God. It goes on. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. So this rescue is there. The satisfaction is there. The Lord hears us. He rescues us. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. That is satisfying. And I, and I know if you think about your own life, and as I look around, I know that your lives have, have done this. You, you have had brokenheartedness. You have been crushed in spirit, and the Lord came through. He was near to you. He rescued you, and you can exalt him because of it. You cried out and he said, I am here and mighty to save. The one who is righteous, now it kind of contrasts the righteous and the evil. The one who is righteous has many uh, adversities, but the Lord rescues him from them all. The one, uh, he protects all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil brings death to the wicked. So righteous, the righteous are having life, right, and rescue. Evil brings death to the wicked. And those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord redeems the life of his servants. Redeems, right? Buys them back, ransoms them, pays for you. He redeems your life and all. This is the great last line of verse 22. All who take refuge in him will not be punished. That's what this says. When we partake in the Lord's Supper, that's what this says. That all who would take refuge in him and what he has accomplished would not be punished. Why? Because he was punished for you. And he was punished for me. So we come and we've tasted and seen that and we come to remember and, and celebrate and proclaim that we have tasted and seen that again today. There's punishment to be had, but, but there's righteousness to be given to those who would believe. John 3, 16 through 18. God loved the world in this way. That he sent his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have what? Eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Right? This was a rescue operation. Anyone who believes in Him is not condemned or is no longer condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned. He didn't have to come and condemn us. There's enough of that already by our own actions, by our own sin. Anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. What does that tell us? Some people say, well, let's see how judgmental that is. No, God's like, I've sent the Son. Taste and see that He is good. 
partake of him and, and his sacrifice, and you will not perish. There will not be judgment. There will not be condemnation for those who believe. What does Romans tell us? There's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But the struggle is real, isn't it? God says this out of Jeremiah in 2.13. He says, my, my people have committed a double evil, a double sin. Well, what is that? Number one, they've abandoned me, the fountain of living water. It, it, it's just, it's, it's, we go out of our lives, right? We thought this Sunday salad was great and healthy, and we go out and we just eat junk. What is God saying? We've abandoned him, the fountain of living water. In him is living water. In he, he is the bread of life. If we partake in him, we will never be hungry. Don't abandon him. As you walk out these doors, don't forget, continue to taste and see and to seek and savor the Savior everywhere you go. So when they've abandoned him, the fountain of living water. And then what do they do when they abandon him? They don't just fast. They dig cisterns looking for something else. Right? You, you've, done, you've dug holes in the ground trying to find water for yourselves. Cracked cisterns that can actually not hold water. What is God saying? You, when you abandon me, the fountain of living water, you turn to something else. And when you turn to something else, that something else will never satisfy. You can taste and taste and taste all day long, but it will never satisfy. It's that, it's that idea. Well, yeah, Sunday morning, Jesus sounds good, but I, I'm going to find something exquisite today to eat at McDonald's. R really? Is that even real meat? I mean, I, exquisite? No. I, I, I actually had a cupcake to bring in today, right? And it was a delicious cupcake. It was at a, we had a wedding last night, and it was pretty good. But those pastries... Way over that thing. I mean, don't go looking for something exquisite outside of God. God can give you what is, what is exquisite. God can give you what satisfies. So, so what do we do? What do we do? Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Sow righteousness for yourselves and reap faithful love. So, right, you reap what you sow, right? So, so put in righteousness, work to obey and love God and cherish God and, and let His righteousness fill you and fully satisfy you. And as you do that, you will reap His faithful love, that peace and that hope and that endearing quality, that, that, that opportunity that, that gives you, that you can just turn to God and give Him that hug. It's there for you. Break up your unplowed ground. Break up your unplowed ground. Break up your stubborn hearts. So it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and sends righteousness on you like the rain. I, I want to taste and see like that. I want to invest by loving God and loving others, by, by cherishing the righteousness that he gave me through the blood and body that was given on the cross and through faith in Christ. I want that to rain down on me every day and satisfy me every day. But the battle in life for every believer is to believe every day that nothing will satisfy us like Jesus. That's the battle. That every day, every moment, wherever you go, that nothing else will satisfy you like Jesus. This is the truth we must believe. We must know for sure that everything else in life will leave us hungry except for Jesus. Then, by faith. By faith, every day. We're righteous, we'll live by faith. By faith, we must seek daily to taste of Him, to have the longings of our soul met in Him, and to experience and pursue Him in hope every day. The temptation for us to leave the only one, right, that can truly satisfy us for something that cannot satisfy us is crazy. But it's a real temptation. So keep hungering for Him. Keep pursuing Him. And keep remembering that He has rescued you and that He is good. Amen? Let's stand together. I'm going to invite the worship team back up and we're going to head into a time of, of worship and response and partaking together uh, of the Lord's Supper. So we'll have them come, come on up. As we do that, I'm going to go take the lids off here. Um, I, I want to just encourage you that this is, again, not, not a legalistic thing that we do in order to earn God's favor or earn His salvation, 
this is, we're coming to, hi, to him today, we're coming to partake today because he has given us himself, because we have trusted ourselves to him, and because in that faith he has forgiven us of our sin and washed us clean. This is the work of God, and we are, again, experiencing this and tasting and seeing today what has already happened in our hearts. So now, if you haven't tasted and seen, if you haven't come into relationship with God, this is for you to watch. Watch as we proclaim to you what God has done for us. Watch as we proclaim to you that this is tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. And just observe. And, and, or I invite you, and God invites you, and David is inviting you to taste and see that the Lord is good. For you to humbly come to Him right now for your salvation. That as we begin singing in a minute, that you be quiet and you, you, you have some reflection in your own heart. That you say, you know what, I am sinful. I have been trying. I have been sitting on Jesus' lap as hard and tightened up as I possibly can be for years and years and years. And I just need to stop and say, I don't have the answers. I need to stop and say, I was wrong. I need to stop and say, I need forgiveness. And then embrace Him as your Father, as your Savior. And once you've tasted and seen, then you come and partake and taste and see with us and proclaim with us. They are they're double cup, right? There's a juice on top of a cracker, so take two when you come up. And we're just going to, the lights will come down a little bit. The, the, the instrumental will be playing. A time for you to reflect in your own heart. A time for you to, to pray and to think through this. A time for you just to worship God. Whatever that time is for uh, as we do that, uh, as you prepare your heart. And then when you're ready, you can come up the aisle on your own you know, or with your family. Or, and maybe if you're unable to walk up here, grab somebody next to you and say, hey, would you grab a cup for me? But walk up the center aisles and, and grab your, your elements. And then if you walk back to your seats, taking those elements with you, and we'll just continue to worship and, and keep those there. We, we will, after our second song we sing, we'll, I'll come back up and we'll partake together. We'll read scripture, we'll pray, we'll partake together, and then we'll send off with a great, a great worship, okay? Does that make sense? Let's go ahead, let's go ahead and sing.